Hello? Can you hear me? Right? Okay. I consider it yes. So, hello everyone, my name is Ivan Echas, and this talk will be about the REST APIs, which is kind of a you know, boring topic, because it was, it was already a lot of uh, things said about REST, and uh, I would like to talk more about putting the REST APIs together to do something uh, more with that. So, uh, this is an obligatory slide that I need, needed to do with the name of uh, this presentation. So why I'm giving this talk in the first place? So uh, I felt some need to share my experience uh, of working with a product or project that is putting more REST APIs together to, to build something uh, on top of that. And since the REST API is so popular, uh, there is a chance that you uh, end up in similar situation sooner or later. So either you will provide some REST API or you will need to integrate with some services that uh, provide this kind of stuff. So uh, the whole thing about the REST APIs or the using the APIs in general is not re reinventing the wheel. So why should we start from scratch and, and build something if there is already some service that uh, provides the same or similar functionality with already uh, is, which is already running in production or has some uh, community around that. So you basically, instead of starting from scratch, you look around and see, hey, this service is nice, it has REST API, I will put it together with my service and we'll go on. So the talk today is how to put the wheels together to not end up with something like this. I put this slide mainly to some kind of this is my car, by the way. So I just wanted some appreciation or, or some, you know, uh, everything bad is good for something. So the thing that you lose your wheels is good for using it in presentation. So I will to today talk about how to fasten your wheels together to your car. The car is your application that it doesn't uh, fall apart in uh, after some time. So. This is usually how the uh, talks about the REST API start. So uh, how, how many of you knows what, what uh, REST API means? Okay. okay, that's kind of expected. But I will not go into the definition because I think that uh, we would be able to find here maybe two or three groups of people that would able to argue a lot of time about what the rest actually means. So I will avoid this because, you know, it's always easy to insult somebody just saying that his API is not restful. <laughs> so instead of this, I will talk about colorful API. And that just means that the API, you can consume it simply by producing you know, typing curl in your command line and giving some uh, arguments. Really easy to do. You don't have to read manuals or some schemas of, of the API itself. You know, you can try the basic even from the web, web browser. So I call it curling as we have the uh, Olympics game just starting. So let's go curling. So usually when you have a REST API, what you can do is when you call get and some paths, you get the, uh, it's called resources uh, usually. And then there, there is convention that basically says that if you use the post, 
HTTP where then you usually create some things uh, if you use put, you update things or patch. You know, we already getting in the situation that uh, some of the services use put, some of the services use patch. Delete is kind of obvious, but that, that's not the point. This is, that is not really what uh, matters when you are building this kind of applications. So the most important thing about REST that I see or what I think is that it's simple to use. So instead of the top one, is you, need, you need to put a lot of words together to get the same. You know, this said that REST API is not that polite, you know, you just get coffee. So today I want to talk about putting the, uh, these APIs together. This uh, a risk that I will state the things that seem obvious, but you know the switch from the standard or uh, classic approach to building application to the integration one is kind of might be hard, especially when you try to get or use the techniques that you used before and apply it on to, to the new architecture model. So, and I will try to. Uh, use a metaphor of building house, but uh, u usually uh, the metaphor is that when we put the software together, we are building something like a house or building. And but I will uh, use a bit of slightly different one, and it's uh, we as a service provide the user ability to have house as a service. So basically, the user com comes and he he or she wants the house. So we say, okay, no problem, we'll build, build it for you. And every request builds some house. So that's basically what uh, I would try to apply these differences. So uh, the usual approach to building these applications is that you have some kind of black belt foreman that is able to do everything for you. You know, he, uh, he or she knows how to build walls, how to build, or how to paint, how to build the roof, everything you, you need, you need, knows this one monolithic guy. And this is really uh, where the relation that the base come in place because they provide a lot of features that uh, support this kind of uh, application. So uh, why are we switching from this, this approach? Or what's, what's bad about this? Some uh, people say that it doesn't scale. I'm not sure because a lot of smart people are working, working on the underlying services. So basically that doesn't have to be the issue. But uh, more likely there's a chance that it, when you are putting this one application together, it takes some time, the developers come and go, requirements come and go, and uh, sooner or later, you end up in a situation where the code is getting har harder, to, uh, harder to maintain. So this, this is one, one thing that uh, led us to uh, think about a different approach. And the second thing is that sooner or later, we are forced or we need to integrate something that is already done there, you know. Somebody just came and implemented something before we had chance to do it on our own. So basically, there is no escape of, from your uh, traditional approach. And I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Ruby on Rails. Okay, there are some people. So basically, this is the approach of the uh, 10 minutes blog post or, or blog application in 10 minutes. So uh, I will now talk about uh, the other approach. And that's uh, instead of the one uh, foreman, I, I use the, the foreman word here as the guy that builds the house. I'm also working on a project that is called foreman. It's just coincidence. And uh, instead of this one guy knowing everything, uh, he knows how to delegate the things. So there are these small people there that are responsible and know well how to 
do the stuff. So for example, in our case, there is service that knows how to uh, work with, with the content or repositories. There is service uh, uh, that knows how to uh, set up DNS or DHCP, you know, you name it. And uh, so instead of uh, this guy doing everything uh, by uh, him own, he delegates. And what are, what are the issues uh, where you switch to, to this kind of stuff? So I will now talk about how to get these RESTful in interfaces and put into something that is uh, useful. So from RESTful to useful. One thing that the REST APIs do is that they provide or they, uh, their API calls are kind of atomic, which is not always the case uh, when you need to do something useful. So you usually need to put more uh, calls together and there is a bunch of issues that comes with it as well. But before you even start uh, building this up, you will probably be facing the issue that you need some kind of uh, design for the API. And from my experience, it's important, but not that much. You know, there is the whole theory of how you should put or how you should form the APIs if you should use nested data or if you should use some kind of uh, relations or you uh, should include the relations between the uh, resources in the API. But from my consumer perspective, it's really not that important. The most important thing or the thing that I find most useful uh, when integrating uh, another uh, services were the examples. So one thing that we built, this is just you know, the difference between uh, nice API with the tie and the one without it. You know, you can use both of them. It maybe shows that the developers care, that the, the API is consistent, but uh, again, it's not that important. So if you are doing this kind of stuff, try to not spend all of the time fighting uh, what, what approach should be the best. And instead, try to automate the things that uh, might be important. Uh, in our case, we identified as the most important thing uh, when you integrate the APIs are the examples. And you know, it's a part of documentation and documentation tends to obsolete. So we have a tool that is able to uh, produce these examples from the test. You know, we write the test already because we need it for other purposes. And we, we can just run the test, collect the results, produce the examples in the documentation. So you, know, you don't have to spend too much time to get something that might be useful for others. Duck. There are other things that need to be figured out. Uh, with the traditional approach where you have the dead base, the solid uh, dead base under, under your application sitting down and being able to respond to every your request, there is usually no problem with, uh, with getting or producing uh, the responses for the request. But uh, once you switch to the model that the uh, services itself do the work and you ju you're just delegating, there is a big, uh, or there is probability that you will start, uh, or the user will start waiting too much, you know? Uh, and there, there are uh, possible ways how to deal with it. And we can take a look at that. that. So there are two kind of slowness in when, when doing the REST API integration. One is when you are presenting the data to the user, because instead of just uh, going to that base, doing the select, everything's done, you need to do uh, many calls to underlying services. And as I, as I told before, the calls to the REST API are usually atomic, and the folks that produce the API are not very keen on making some kind of bulk actions or getting more data than the atomic one. So you end up with the situation that you're or showing one page or uh, calling one API call to your, your service causes 
you know, I don't know 100, 200 calls to extend the, uh, external services. This really doesn't, you know, the design is really nice, but it's not really useful or usable. So sooner or later, you will probably end up with a situation where you need some kind of local storage anyway, just for or to be able to present the data more real time. You can either use some kind of indexing uh, tool, like we, we use Elasticsearch, but we use also the uh, relational database just to be able to uh, produce the, the output more quickly. Also, uh, there is always a need to have some kind of relation stored uh, outside of the services that you are integrating in, because you know the services itself don't know about each other, so you need something that is able to store this. But this tends to the second issue, and that's the modifications. Now, modifications are uh, uh, always uh, take more time than the presentation, and when you in in introduce also your local at base, it just yet another problem that you need to solve. From the uh, traditional uh, applications, you rely on the uh, relation that base to handle a lot of stuff for you. You, you might not even uh, notice. And one thing that you need to start to care uh, once you switch to the model that you do some calls outside your application are basically uh, transactions and locking. Transactions and locking are the things that the re relation that base are really good at. And once you move some kind, some of your logic outside of your of your database, you need to start to care about it. So, don't don't forget. So the usual approach when you come into a situation that there is, you know, we have three services, and you know that when you do this and this and this call, you end up with something that these separate services weren't able to do, and you know you can have profit from that, you can uh, uh, give the user some functionality they didn't have before. So the first na naive approach is, you know, provided you build web application to just trigger these uh, calls uh, as part of your uh, process of responding to the request. So user sends a request and you say do A, do B, do C, and then collect the result, you're done. But the problem is that the request takes some time, so soon, sooner or later you will say, okay, I need to do something with it. So what is the first thing that uh, comes in mind is, okay, I will switch or move the logic of the calls outside of the web request, and there is plenty of tools that allows you to do the, some kind of queuing, so you put to the queue, working queue, what you want to do, and you just say the user, okay, uh, I accepted the request, and after a while, uh, you will be provided with, with the, with the uh, results. So, there is one issue with it, and that's that the users uh, like get, getting some kind of feedback, you know? It, uh, especially when it's long-running uh, service or long-running request, you know, they, they want to know how the request uh, goes. And with just one, one queue and these uh, jobs not related together too much, it's kind of hard to give the user the answer where or when uh, they could expect the, the result. So the users just ask, are we there yet? No, are we there yet? No, are we there yet? No. And they even don't know where they, or when they should expect that. The second issue, I probably have it here as well, is the stability. That's the same that, you know, we rely or relied before on the that base that was uh, handling this. But what happens when the second call or the call to the second service fails. How should we uh, uh, respond to that? And uh, how the users find out that something goes, went wrong? 
No, there, there might be situations that the user is just seeing the, the some kind of notification that something is going on for two days. No, and underlying services are doing nothing because something failed in the in the middle. But you know, this is all all the kind of stuff that you need to think about when you start uh, doing that. Another thing that the database do for us are uh, dealing with shared resources. You know, when you modify something on your database, during the modification time, uh, other requests can't modify that or there's an, uh, some locking strategy so that you don't have to uh, uh, care about that. Once you move your data out, you need to start to care. So let's uh, try to think about simple example. So let's say I have a, uh, some service that controls the house. Uh, it's able to do some all, all the uh, nice things like changing bulbs. So you basically the steps are you turn off the light, then change change the bulb and turn it on again. That's okay. It works in in testing in QA. It works great. But then we have another action that this house is being in, is able to do and it's making dinner. And the first step of this is turning on the light. So what happens when somebody is in the middle of changing the bulb? No. <laughs> this probably happens. And this, you know, it, it's not that rare, th this situation. And that's why you should really care about the corner cases. You should care about uh, what really uh, or what possibilities are that some uh, running action might lead to some other uh, not wanting states. So we've been in, the, in this state, not in this particular, but uh, we, we went in our project uh, through these stages already, and that's, that's why I'm here. I want to share this experience and if you happen to uh, doing the same, maybe you will remember that, okay, I, I should also have this in mind. You know, it's really easy to just take the, the API together. Everyone uh, can write the curl or something similar in their favorite programming language. But uh, it doesn't scale at the end because you will end up just solving very, very bad issues. So some folks might say that, okay, the problem is the REST API protocol or the HTTP. No, because a couple of or some issues just uh, res are resulting from, let's say, timeouts. No, the service, you, you do the call and the service is busy doing all the stuff that uh, it wasn't able to react on your request in time. So we get timeouts. And uh, so folks start saying, okay, we need something, some better transport protocol that is able to uh, basically guarantee that the uh, requests are coming uh, to, the, to the services. So usually the easiest way to do is introduce some kind of message broker. We can, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the message brokers in general. Okay, so you already know that you basically, uh, it provides the mechanism how to send a, uh, the message somewhere else and uh, the broker should guarantee you that the message is, is got, doesn't get lost. That's my understanding of, of message brokers. So, okay, you solved one issues, but, or one kind of issues, but there's always chance that the issue is not in the communication. The issue might be just in the service that should do the job and it doesn't do it for uh, many of reasons. You know, th there might be some inconsistency, there might be low space on the, ser on the server, you know, and message broker won't uh, help much with these cases. So our current solution to this is uh, having an orchestration layer underneath. So what does the orchestration layer mean? It means that you can basically model your process of, or the model the request that you plan to do on 
your uh, while serving the user's request, and instead of running it directly, you wrap in, in into some tool that is able to track the progress of the of the uh, handling. And so every time a new request is sent to external service, this tool is able to note that uh, there is need for persistence for that, and it allows you to do a lot of uh, things that you couldn't do before. So basically what we do is when the requests come, the first phase it comes to is the planning phase. Now we try to build a tool that doesn't uh, need some kind of static workflows defined in some XMLs, and we want to be able to define the the process that will be run uh, in run runtime. It also helps with uh, pluggability, you know? You can write another plugin to our application that every time something happens in the system, you could introduce just one more step. And it's really nice thing to be able to do. So after the planning phase is done, and this planning phase doesn't do anything, modi or any modifying change on the uh, outside of our local database, and that's the way how to avoid the inconsistencies between services as long as possible. So in the plan phase, we basically uh, try to check out that everything or the things that are requested are really possible, and then we sw switch or starting start to evaluate the the plan that we produce. So basically, I, I borrowed the UML uh, syntax ha here. So we are able to do, uh, or to identify the actions that can run in parallel, and the executor of, of our tool is able to handle the, uh, the request and the responses. And the most important thing is that every state in the, of the run is serializable. So we serialize the, the state of, of this process as it goes. Uh, for some you know, uh, heavy operation or he heavy computation operations, this might not be the best thing and you would need to uh, think more about how to optimize the storage. But you can start re really simply, you can really use just traditional relation that base for that, no problem just for the, f at least for the start, and you can then solve the, the scaling later. But the important thing is that in this case, when the do B fails, we, we can manipulate or we can do more things to do that. Even the service can go down, you can restart the server, but we have still the state of the process in the meantime. So another thing is, I don't know if, if it's visible enough, but basically the thing that you have the state stored in the database or in some persistence allows you to simply compute what was done and what wasn't and the user gets uh, immediately the progress of the action, you know. I, I need to do three actions, one was already done, 30% easy. And the most important thing is when something fails, also, for example, the, the call to, uh, to the service B failed. We have, again, the persistent state. We can you know, fix, we can make the disk or uh, enlarge the disk of the service or server that the service B is running. We can try to fix uh, what's going on there. We also have kind of uh, good data how to debug things with this approach because since the whole process is serialized, we have all the inputs that the actions in the meantime get. We also store the output. So if something fails, we are able to get this data, look at it. Also, uh, it's really useful thing when you are building or writing a software that you don't run at the end. So basically, we are writing the software, but the, the uh, projects are then run separately outside of our infrastructure. You know, either uh, upstream 
community or the customers, and you really can't say, okay, I will just SSH your machine, look around the database, and you know, you need to fix these, these, and I need to first check if these data are correct, and if not, okay, we will try to switch it. This is, these are the things that you can do if you are run your own uh, application and you, you maintain it, you really know what's going on. Once you get in the state that somebody else is maintaining the production mode and it's not the author I of it, it really gets uh, painful to, to do something like debugging without uh, additional support. And the last thing maybe that you need to really care about is the locking. So uh, what we do is that in the plan phase, uh, besides just checking uh, the usual things like the validation, for example, for the password, or you know if the user is authorized to do the things that uh, they claim they can, we also uh, make sure that there is not additional process running against these uh, uh, resources that might conflict with the, the, the requested ones. And if they do, we, we say it immediately so we don't promise to do something that might change and we just uh, couldn't, couldn't solve that. So uh, what we do is basically you have the process or the task that is running against, uh, against the data uh, as a first class citizen and you can assign th this task to the resources. So for example, when I change the password of the user and it needs to get, go to some external service, I create the task that uh, handles the change and if some other process or some other user tr try to doing the same against the same re resource, we uh, don't allow it. So uh, the task is assigned to the user and until the task is running, uh, nobody else is able to do this kind of operation. We also uh, needed more general locking. You know, it's not just it's locked or it's not locked because in many cases you can do one type of operation on the resource, but uh, another operation can still going on as well. So they, they just don't overlap. So I, I get into the summary. I think the time is good. So what, what are the lessons learned from, from uh, our uh, approach? So one thing is, or from our history, one thing is that the API design of the services is important, but it's not crucial, you know. The most important thing, or from my perspective, is the stability and the consistency. I, I really like when, when I uh, start using some API that no, no matter what, which part of I use, I, I can rely on the same conventions. The conventions itself, you don't have to agree with everyone else in the world what the conventions are because we probably wouldn't get that anyway. But once you set the conventions, to start to follow them uh, as much as possible. Another thing or, or the good thing that uh, we experienced is that having some way of automating documentation is good. Usually uh, folks building the REST API don't care much about documentation or at least that's my uh, uh, experience because you know you can always look into the code. but. Uh, for the custom uh, consumers of the API, I think it's really important. And the most important thing here is once you start crawling external services, think about the corner cases. You know, spend the time thinking what happens if some service is not available. What happens when there are two tasks running the, against the same resource? What happens when the task run, uh, runs a long time? You know, the, all the things that you don't have to ask when you are building against relation database, local uh, database, run transaction, all these questions, you need to ask them again. Otherwise, you will end up in some kind of uh, maintenance hell. So because we are writing the Ruby and Rails applications, we build our tools in Ruby and Rails 
So if you happen to uh, be in the same ecosystem as we are, I encourage you to look at, at these links. The first is the API documentation tool that we use. The second thing is the orchestration tool that we, we are building for us and it's a uh, general purpose so, so you could find it useful as well. And these are the projects that we are ap applying this approach. So now we have some time for questions. So uh, feel free to ask anything related to the topic. Okay. Yeah, so basically the first uh, step we need to figure out is or the, uh, is being able to store the procedure the pl to, to do the planning and execution. So right now when something fails, uh, there is a manual step needed to, to continue with that. Uh, the rollbacks are the next thing to do. So basically we, uh, because we have the, uh, we basically produce the workflow or, or the process consists from, from some uh, Ruby classes. We are able to, or the plan is to be able, for example, when you have the action create user, to be able to say what's the opposite of it, plus having some uh, additional logic being able to define as well, so that uh, we will basically then able to uh, produce the plan for the rollback. And since we have the, the dynamic part there that uh, some third party user could put additional step in the whole process. Uh, you know, we don't, don't want to start with the rollback uh, until we know that uh, all, all these steps support that. So when there is some step that doesn't have this rollback functionality, we still want to first stop it, resolve that, and uh, if we then reduce it to the steps that have the rollbacks, we can produce uh, with this output. So it's really about uh, trying to keep the consistency between data as, as much as possible. We were in the state or before we had some kind of rollbacks that were kind of uh, you know, simple that uh, so when something failed, we tried to, to run some rolling back actions, but uh, s because we didn't have some way how to uh, have control over it and it just didn't work magically. So uh, we want to have the control there. So, any other questions? Okay, if not, or if you are just shy to ask, come to me later. Uh, we, 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 we can talk about uh, the, all the stuff that I've presented here. So one, one uh, thing maybe just explain what we are doing in, with the project. So the foreman is the config, config management tool that is built now on top of Puppet. So it allows you to automate the infrastructure and the configuration plus provisioning on uh, different services. And uh, the Cattle project built on top of foreman. It's built as a plugin that provides the content management. So repository syncing. Uh, defining the versions of software in different environments and this kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that stuff, uh, I could be handy here as well. So thank you very much for attention and uh, have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>